Hey folks, my name is Mario, and this is the first in a series of videos that I wanted to make, especially for folks that are facing HPV-related throat cancer like I did last year. This first video will specifically be about the discovery of my cancer and the diagnosis, and all the things that happened that had to happen before treatment even started. At the end, I will discuss what's to come in the other videos. Before all that, let me start with a disclaimer. These videos are just my own experiences in the hope that it will be helpful to someone who is going through or about to go through the same thing. This is not professional medical advice, so if you are facing this issue, please consult with your doctors. Also, I will devote an entire separate video advocating in favor of the HPV vaccine so that others do not have to go through what I went through. That video will be more for the general public, but I did want to mention it here. That's it for introduction. Let me talk about the discovery and the diagnosis. I'm in my mid-40s for one thing, so relatively young for cancer. This whole thing was a huge surprise, totally unexpected. I was sitting in front of the computer on a conference call for work. I put my hand on my neck just casually like this and felt a lump. It was an unusual lump because it was only on one side of my neck, in the front but off center. In other words, it wasn't like when you get swollen gland due to a cold or a virus where you can see the swelling on both sides. So that was a clue that something was wrong. Fortunately, my timing was lucky, in a sense. Since I was working from home that day, and it was a little bit slow, I decided to call the doctor right away. And I got an appointment right away, same day. On any other given day, I may have blown it off. So it's a good thing I didn't. That very day, the nurse practitioner at the family practice said it looked kind of weird and sent me to an ultrasound. The ultrasound said yes, it was concerning, so they sent me to an ENT specialist who put a long probe, long skinny probe through my nose, down my throat, it's like a camera, and said, bad news, it looks like cancer. Then they sent me for a biopsy, which required general anesthesia, since they had to cut a piece out way down in my throat, and that's when it was confirmed. All of this happened very quickly in the course of two to three weeks, so it was really fast. And I'm very grateful for all the medical professionals along the way that kept the process moving quickly and diagnosed it correctly. Later, I had a PET scan to determine if the cancer had spread anywhere else in my body, and fortunately, it had not. And finally, it was determined by testing that my cancer was, in fact, HPV-related, which was, in a relative sense, good news because it tends to be less aggressive than other forms of cancer and re is known to react well to radiation in particular. I ended up going to MD Anderson for treatment in Houston, which I didn't know at the time, but is among the best in the world at treating head and neck cancers in particular. Again, stroke of luck, as I live only a few hours away, people do go there from all over the world. They fly in, find housing, and stay for a couple of months or even longer for treatment. I had a perfectly good option to get treated locally near my house, so obviously you have to do what's right for you and your situation. What ultimately convinced me to go to MD Anderson was that I really like I really liked that all three of the main cancer specialties, oncology, radiology, and surgery, not to mention all the supporting specialties like dental, auditory, and speech, all work together as a cohesive team. They share the same records, the same scheduling systems, they had access to the same information about me all at the same time in real time. If you have just been diagnosed and you're wondering where to get treated, 
my suggestion is you look for something similar. This concept of a team of doctors, because it does take a team working together for you. So anyway, the doctors decided to treat me with both radiation and chemotherapy simultaneously over the course of about seven weeks. But before treatment even started, a bunch of things had to happen that you wouldn't normally think about, specifically three major things. The first was a deep examination of my teeth. Because radiation passes through the mouth area during this treatment, it is very important to prepare and protect the teeth for that. I had to go to a special dentist, and if I had had any rotten teeth or questionable teeth, they would have needed to be pulled before the treatment. Fortunately, I didn't have that, those issues. Just a cleaning, I had to fix an old cavity, but I also got fitted for fluoride trays. These are flexible plastic inserts, which are created as molds for your teeth, top and bottom. The idea is to spread a fluoride gel on them as a protective measure for your teeth and keep the trays in your mouth, top and bottom, every night for at least 10 minutes. What this does is protect the teeth from decay. And get this, I have to do this every night for the rest of my life. That's how significantly the radiation affects the teeth. It makes, radiation makes the teeth more susceptible to rapid decay and very bad things can happen if the teeth are not protected. The worst of which is probably called, it's called osteoradionecrosis. Think of it as a kind of a death of the bone that apparently is very painful and difficult to treat. So, the next treatment, the next pre-treatment uh, item was um, measuring my swallowing function. So this is number two. Again, because this area was be, would be affected by the radiation, you can imagine if your ability to swallow is damaged in any way, that can be a huge quality of life problem. So this was a critical part of the treatment. Prior to the, this was prior to the treatment, so the doctors at this point were simply establishing a baseline. They wanted to see how strong it was to begin with so that they could compare the before and after. <clears throat> but as a, as a part of this, I did get a set of swallowing exercises to do every day during the treatment and afterwards. Just like, the, just like have, doing the fluoride trays, the doctors have basically told me never to stop doing these exercises. Do them every day. It is what it is. Now, along with the swallowing exercises, my doctors strongly recommended that I endure that I endure the treatment without a feeding tube. Let me explain. A feeding tube is a tube that is inserted in your body and it allows you to pour liquid nourishment directly into your stomach without having to swallow. Think of it as like a funnel. The radiation destroys tissue. And toward the end of the treatment, you are basically a bloody mess on the inside. And it hurts to swallow. So a lot of people take advantage of a feeding tube to avoid the pain of swallowing. But my doctors were totally against it. The reason being, if you go without a feeding tube, you are forced to keep on swallowing, keeping the throat tissues elastic and moving while you are healing. They feel this is very important to preserve the function for after the treatment and for the rest of your life. So I went without and it was difficult because it was painful, but I did have medication to manage the pain, which had its own issues, but we'll talk about that afterwards and in, in, in another video. Looking back, I feel it definitely was the best decision since my swallowing function after the treatment is still excellent. So thank you, MD Anderson, for that one. And number three, the last pre-treatment item was I had to get fitted for a radiation mask. I had no idea this was even a thing, but it makes sense. What it is is a mask made of plastic that is molded in the shape of your head and neck. The purpose of which is to keep your, keep your head and neck in the same position every time you have a radiation treatment. <clears throat> so in the course of treatment, you might have 
30 to 35 different sessions. That's four or five times a week over six or seven weeks. The way that the mask is created, they start with a plastic mesh that's been heated, so it's temporarily soft and pliable, and they mold it on your face and neck. It doesn't, doesn't hurt to do that. <clears throat> it's just warm. The molded mask then hardens permanently, and the excess material, think of it like wings, can then be secured onto a radiation table with buckles while you're wearing it, basically immobilizing you so that the radiation hits the exact spot it's supposed to. This can be scary because you are almost entirely incapacitated. And I can imagine anyone with claustrophobia in particular will have problems with this. I've never had problems with claustrophobia before, but I got anxious and had to calm myself down the first couple of times in the mask. But it passed, I got used to it. Here's the actual mask, I'm gonna show it to you. <clears throat> Just wanna give you an idea. So it goes on like this, you get, you lay down on the table and you get positioned for the radiation and you basically have to be there. It doesn't, each session doesn't last very long. It's probably, I don't know, less than 10 minutes. But, so that's, this is, that's what it is. This is what it looks like. I got to keep it afterwards. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I wanted to, to keep it for purposes of this video. Uh, so we'll see. Um, that's it for now. Thank you for listening. In the next video, I will discuss the treatment itself, the details of the seven weeks. And after that, I will have one on the post-treatment experience. Links for all the videos are provided below. Bye for now. Oh, by the way, I wanted to personally thank Jason Barker, who has a series of YouTube, also has a series of YouTube videos on this same topic that I highly recommend. I'll put a link to his channel below. They're well worth your time. One of Jason's videos was a big help to me when I was first diagnosed. Thank you again.